So we're going to talk about transport assessment, in particular new processes that are developing and which will apply to any kind of mid-tier transit and land development in particular around it. Rohit Sharma is going to talk to us about this from his experience in his PhD on this, which he did with us, and also work in London, particularly with Transport for London. And this is a, an evolving area, one that we need to keep up with because it is showing us new elements that we felt were not available, not, not really there in the assessment processes we've had before. So Rohit is going to talk about this and then I'll have a little chat with him. Over to Rohit. Hi, my name is Rohit Sharma and I'll talk about the transport economic appraisals, um, how they were done in past recent years and how they have been evolved recently in past two years and how that space is evolving rapidly and how those things are contributing in the business cases and getting the money from the government to invest in the projects that they were hesitant to invest in in the past because it didn't make economic sense to the government. So overall business case includes a strategic case which is what is the relevance of it, how does it align with the national policies, local policies, or regional policies, um, and the economic case which is which is the key point where the government decides this is a value for money and we will invest in this and we have funds dedicated to it in the coming years too. The management case includes if that that transport project can be delivered in practice so what is the feasibility of it. Commercial case is about how the government can procure things around that project, how if there is only one supplier for a scheme uh, for rolling stock then and if the procurement um, guidelines of the government say now you need to have two or three suppliers then the commercial case becomes difficult sometimes or the land take things around that. Um, I would try to focus just on the economic case in this presentation. Uh, for transport scheme there can be large number of benefits um, because transport is an enabler for a city and it can have significant benefits to the society and the economics or urban economy of the city or region. Traditionally we divide the different impacts of a transport scheme by looking into level one impacts which is direct impacts of a transport scheme which is journey time, um, reduction in crowding in public transport, greenhouse gas emissions, accidents. Then there can be a, a more high level impacts at the economy of uh, clustering of uh, jobs and that can have a significant impact on agglomeration benefits and then the labor supply it can change the all industrial areas in London to a uh, high income service oriented jobs because of a significant investment in transportation then there can be land use changes and then the most important ones these days is about the dependent development so if a transport scheme can unlock land development which couldn't happen without that scheme and that unlocking of land development can deliver additional homes and jobs for the local area. And then there are significant uh, health benefits or disbenefits sometimes. So the car schemes which support car use can have significant health disbenefits as compared to a walking and cycling scheme which can lead to significant uh, health benefits. For any transport scheme we need to consider a large number of impacts and if you're not considering that then we have been biased in a certain way because we are just overlooking different impacts if you're not considering all. Transport appraisal had traditionally focused on journey time benefits or disbenefits of a scheme, um, journey time reliability and that all combines together to a benefit cost ratios. So benefits can be journey time benefits and car users have significantly high value of time that leads to their 
high journey time benefits if there is any reduction in their journey times. As compared to a person who is walking or cycling, their value of time is lower, much lower uh, than compared to a person who is using car because we have thought traditionally that whoever is walking or cycling or using a bus is likely to be poor as compared to someone who is driving a car, so their value of time um, becomes quite low. In the past, we have been benefiting the beneficiaries of the government who are already rich in a certain way. So that has been a biased approach in a certain way. Now that process has been evolving, uh, that is shifting towards the time-bound impact on air quality of the transport scheme. So in the Europe and the UK, we have statutory emission limits around NOx levels. So every city, whoever has her exceedance in the NOx levels, need to do something about it legally. So now the focus is to improve air quality. Not The focus is not how we can improve the journey times of someone or car users. The focus is how we can improve the air quality, which is more evolving towards into physical activity, how the health benefits have been included in the transport schemes now. The climate change, net zero, land development, those four topics are now being included, which were not part of the economic appraisal of transport schemes. I worked on a economic appraisal for a road bridge scheme, and we developed a very bespoke economic model for that scheme, which showed that the health benefits, which were not accounted for previously, are substantially high. They are not as high as car journey time benefits from that bridge, but they're not far off. They are about 60% of that car journey time benefits, which, which is quite substantial that that big chunk of benefits were missed out in the past. And this is all because people will walk or cycle more and they will perhaps won't get sick. They will take less, less sick leaves from the office. They will rock up to work every day. They will have more productivity benefits. Another project we did was on emission charging schemes. And as mentioned that uh, every city who has high NOx levels, which exceeds the legal limit, has to, do, has, has to do something about it. So the best way is to charge people. So wherever there is exceedance in NOx level on that corridors, they, they said we're going to charge people to enter in that. And largely, they, mostly they are around the CBDs. So they said whoever enters CDD, we're going to charge. So for example, they, if there's exceedance, um, and ex exceedance in the um, at Perth city CBD area, then they put fifty dollars charge. So what some people did was they started rerouting. They started avoiding going to Perth and just take a longer route. So if the distance was ten kilometers, now the distance become fifteen kilometers. Some people opted to shift to a low emission vehicle or electric vehicle, but what we found in this specific city in the UK that the people who will upgrade their vehicle or change their mode from car or diesel car to buses or more sustainable transport is much lower as compared to the disbenefits that we'll get from the people who will reroute or uh, just in some way they'll end up increasing the journey time distance and pollute more rather than so the benefits is not significant as compared to disbenefits for um, a scheme which is not thought through in detail and that's the reason we find that only London has been able to implement the emission charging scheme in in the UK and every city is a bit struggling because there can be public outrage because of that and it doesn't make economic sense sometimes so they need a more holistic approach to reduce the emissions and improve the air quality in the area, not just for a small 
patch of the city, but for the whole city or the whole, perhaps the whole country. Because he also found that the people who will uh, scrap their old vehicles um, somewhere in London, if someone decides to scrap its old vehicle and somewhere in the North England, that another person buys that high emission vehicle, he gonna pollute in the North. So you're solving a problem for one area, but you're creating another problem for other area. So that has need to be accounted for in all these schemes. Then we started working on the cycling scheme appraisal recently and understanding what can be the impacts just by putting a two kilometer off street cycling scheme. In the past, it was more about uh, cycling is sustainable and we need to invest in it. But now it's about it has significant economic benefits to the society. It reduces the risk of premature death because um, it reduces the relative risk of catching the non-communicable diseases. It um, helps in condition benefits because it is likely that some people will shift from car use or bus use to cycling. It will have a significant impact on air quality, accidents, uh, greenhouse gases, and there can be disbenefits too because of that. If because the people won't drive and they won't pay the petrol tax, which will have some disbenefit in terms of indirect taxation for the government. But the benefits to the society just outweighs the disbenefits. It's just significant amount of health benefits, which were not accounted for previously, uh, which is about 66% of the health benefits which can uh, come forward. And the benefit cost ratio for a scheme which it was just a strategic case like yeah we will deliver this cycling track because it's sustainable now it's now it's make economic sense to deliver those schemes and the bcr for those schemes are above one or perhaps sometimes above two and three the next one i want to discuss is about a scheme i worked on in london which was about how we can deliver a tram or a brt on a corridor which is quite deprived corridor in London and the government started looking at the how we can deliver it so to deliver a tram or a BRT is just take out one lane from the car users or the highway users and put a tram or a BRT so there would be the public transport benefits which we can quantify which we quantified because uh, the public transport users will increase, there would be benefits, but there would be significant disbenefits for the highway users because we are taking away one car from the people who are traditionally being car owners, car dependent users. And there is a significant amount of industrial land in that specific area. So there, there are freight vehicles which will have this benefit because we are taking away one lane from them. The journey time will increase and there would be significant cost to deliver that scheme, especially in London. So the BCR made no sense to deliver tram or a BRT because the BCR was just 0 0.04, 0 0.06, which doesn't make any value for money to deliver. But in a hindsight, you see, to deliver a tram or BRT in London should make benefit, should have economic sense. but. Then we started looking, then the government asked like, it should make some sense. So we started looking into more detail, what impacts can it have? So we developed a model about what impacts it will have on land development or land use. So if there are 1000 homes being delivered in that corridor, there can be 8000 more homes which can be delivered because of a tram, which won't be delivered if that tram doesn't go in which changes the whole economics of that scheme and the whole narrative. The narrative becomes, we are not talking about the benefit the tram will have on public transport and the city will gain in terms of just public transport. The narrative now is we want to deliver homes and jobs. The only way we can deliver is to put a tram or a BRT. So there's a big shift in how things can be perceived from a transport projects. Um, we showed that 
there can be 8,000 more homes delivered just because of tram, about 7,000 from uh, BRT. The difference is because tram can carry more people, tram has significant more impact on la unlocking of land as compared to a BRT, of which many can be affordable homes, uh, depending on the, how the government wants to decide on the proportion of the homes. To del if those homes been delivered, there's been demand created, the housing markets move, and there's impact on land value. And the impact on land value is significantly high. There would be people will purchase those homes and that will create economic boost for the whole, um, whole city, which is the gross development value, which will be created for because of the purchase of homes. So there would be more homes delivered, more money in the economy, more land value uplift and the benefits from a affordable homes. But there would be also be cost to build those homes. So we account all those things and we just found significant increase in the BCA, about 68 times increase because of tram, about 38 time increase because of BRT, which is quite substantial increases. And then it make economic sense, uh, strategic sense for the government to deliver more homes, deliver that scheme and that scheme will deliver homes. And then it becomes not just the transport department project, it becomes a housing community departments project, a treasury project, full government is involved now. So we have to shift that narrative sometimes to see the bigger picture sometimes or see the impacts a scheme can have more in a significant way at the whole society level. That land value can be created without government support or without involving private companies, but we in our research found that if the government involves private from the starting of the project or the private leads that project and government just provide voluntary support and they have to provide support because the government will approve everything. So, but if there's a significant involvement of private, then we create more land value, can deliver more homes from for the from the scheme and that will have more economic value creation so that processes of transport looking into transport schemes the economic appraisal the whole business cases the narrative around these schemes have evolved in the last couple of years i think about two years it has involved significantly we are not talking about journey time benefits just journey time benefits we are talking about journey time benefits but we are talking about health, we are talking about land impacts, we are talking about um, the carbon emissions, air quality, the concentration of NOx and PM at the local level. And some, like air quality has been included in the transport appraisal just because there's a statutory requirement for the cities to do it. And I think there should be more in the future, there should be statutory requirements around carbon emission limits, which um, should be led through the Paris Agreement, the mode share, uh, how, ma how many people walk and cycle, that will have an impact on, on the society, because if people are healthier, there will be significant impact on the society and the healthcare system public health benefits will outweigh significantly any other disbenefits from this scheme. And there has to be a, a linkage between land use and transport policies. So we are not just looking at the small area, we are looking at the holistic level. And that has been recognized in the, by the UK Treasury recently. And in the new guidance to develop business cases and how they will provide money for funding for different cases is they want to end the dominance of the BCR because there are some councils in the city or in the country, even in Australia, there would be many councils who are poor. They cannot hire a consultant or they cannot, don't have resources internally to monetize all these benefits because they are all are new approaches. You need very specialized skills to undertake all these assessments. So they want to end this dominance of BCR 
and they are saying that ah, if, even if you have a good strategic case, we will approve these schemes because we now understand that they will have some monetary economic benefits. And they are concentrating on prioritizing economic impacts from the environmental impacts of the transport schemes. And they want to have clear objectives of that transport scheme. So if we say that uh, this scheme will help deliver homes and jobs, that's the objective of this scheme. This, so they want very clear objectives from this scheme, not just it's one or two, but quite holistic and quite clear and quantifiable, perhaps. Um, that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rohit. And very interesting to see the way London has become a focus for change that really should reverberate around the world. Do you see any other part of the world that is doing as much as London is doing in this new transport assessment? Um, no, <laughs> yeah. not in English speaking countries. Yeah. Um, in Australia, I think we don't have good appraisal processes um, because we don't even quantify active travel benefits. And the minister was right in one of the meetings that she wanted to do it, but there is no push for it. Or if they do it, then would that make a better case? Perhaps not, which is a shame. Mm. Uh, it should be accounted and should be well recognized. Yeah, and you can account for a lot of things now. Particularly, I liked what you said about the land factor, that homes, building homes, building the economy around that whole process um, is far greater you know, yeah. 68 times increase the value of a BCR. <laughs> My yeah. good. I mean, this, it, it, it's uh, extraordinary. Um, you can, therefore, uh, account for that if you've got the money to pay for that kind of assessment. That's true. Um, so the interesting bit that you added at the end is how the government is moving away from that accounting approach. How the government is moving away from quantifying it all and saying, we will just regulate because we know it works. Yeah, it's true, but it needs to be accounted, I think. Um, the government is suggesting, but how much they will implement would be mm would be uncertain because there would be people in Treasury that really wants to see the PCR values of everything. Yeah. Um, and I think I missed the point that there is land that a narrative is changing towards delivery of homes, but that is improving the density of that corridor. And then we won't have that sprawl that we have at the moment, and that will have other economic benefits. So perhaps you wouldn't not paid enough as a consultant to account for those benefits yet, <laughs> but those can come forward, um, which CUSPS has done already in the past that has quantified the urban sprawl economic benefits. Mm. Okay, so it's going to be into the future a combination of uh, assessment, appraisal that will generally require those benefit cost ratios and sometimes won't because they're obvious. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, Summarized it. And, yeah, and, and and the area is too poor to do it themselves or the uh, projects uh, just need yeah. to be funded and get on. Yeah. With, which is interesting because there, there is, I think, uh, a real social justice yeah. outcome with that if you can do that yeah. sometimes where you just need to get the money to it's it's obvious that yeah. this area needs help yeah. and you don't need to yeah. have great detail but where you've got different options that you need to assess in comparison yeah. then you've really got to get some numbers yeah I think that is so that should be covered in the strategic case um, Treasury is talking about the economic case. Even if you don't monetize the economic benefit, that's okay. But 
we need to have a very strong strategic case. So we cannot say that oh, we will just look at five options and we'll choose one and deliver it. Mm. We need to look at all the options possible. Mm. And it has to be multimodal options, which needs to be looked at, not just for walk or cycling, public transport, walk, cycling, highway. Everything needs should be covered, mm. perhaps it's not covered all the time mm. for time scales and resources, but that would be good if things are covered in mm. a comprehensive way because the transport will have an impact for 10 years, 50 years, sometimes 100 years. So if there's initial investment to get the right decision through, maybe it will take some time, but it will have benefits for the generations. Mm. Well, I think there's another PhD in all of that, um, <laughs> <laughs> and you certainly did some very good work, um, not just in Australia, it was also, well, a lot of it was in India, and uh, uh, the opportunities there for really good quality rail projects that significantly improved the value of land, but also the whole economy improved. Do you want to quickly just explain some of that? Yeah, because so we did work together on the Bangalore case study and the Mumbai case study on what would the impact on the railways in the city and we found significant benefit for the whole city just because there's so much traffic congestion, the delay in journey time to travel from one distance to another is so high that it's creating inequality in the society and I think if you put a railway line, people can access jobs, uh, services much quickly. It creates just a significant difference in the whole society in terms of accessing jobs which will create economic benefits. The journey time has reduced, that has own economic benefits, you can deliver more homes and jobs around the catchment of that area, but the whole city benefits in a certain way. And yeah, just, so your, your numbers indicated that the land value increase was across the whole city, not just in that corridor, and therefore yeah. the whole economy increased. Yeah, that's what we found, yeah, and from our assessment. We were quite surprised mm. <laughs> that that's possible, so we digged into more and yeah. then we realised that. Again, it, that is not part of most transport assessments, is it? It's just very corridor-based. Um, but I would think that Metronet is doing that in Perth, and I think it's certainly the case in some of the Sydney and Melbourne projects. They're big enough to actually improve the whole economy, not just in that corridor, and the land value will reflect that. Yeah. So interesting um, stuff, and I think what you've shown is that there's a liberation now of the importance of land value, and the importance of cycling and walking in our assessments and um, putting serious numbers into that will change our cities to being far less car dependent, far more value in terms of reducing greenhouse gases and all of those yeah. good things, uh, better places to live. Yeah. Better health outcomes for society. Yep. Okay, thank you very much.